We've just heard the, the haunting opening of the Agnus Dei section of Beethoven's Misa Solemnis. Beethoven was something of a shaman of modernity, um, and he wrestled with the issue of what was happening in the midst of all of the turmoil of his time. And I think it's an issue that we're still wrestling with even today. A few years ago, I, I, I had the opportunity to visit the Abbey of Saint-Denis. Um, it's just on the northern outskirts of Paris. Um, this is the church in which uh, all the kings and queens and princes and of, of the blood of the French monarchy uh, have been buried for centuries and centuries. It was a thousand year monarchy. Um, that was overthrown in 1789 and for fits and starts came back, but really that was a, a cataclysmic break almost in wor world history. Um, the Abbey sits now in a not so chic neighborhood, but it's, a, it's really worth visiting if you ever have a chance. It's not only the origin of French Gothic architecture, which is, with its incredible lighting effects and openness and so forth, but it's, it's, it's a haunting kind of reminder of just what happened in 1789. There's this eerie emptiness to it. Um, what happened during the revolution was that mobs came in and ransacked the tombs. They, they threw all of the embalmed bodies and skeletons of the kings and queens out into a pile and set them on fire, dissolved them with acid. Uh, the abbot of the monastery uh, had the presence of mind to see that he could rescue the brilliant sculptures and effigies that went with these tombs. But the tombs are empty today. Uh, at this moment in history, the whole unity of society was blown apart. Monarch, state, church, aristocracy, fractured and replaced with something what? something that Beethoven and people of his generation were still trying to figure out, and I think we still are kind of today. Uh, there's this novel from just after World War II, Thomas Mann, uh, called Dr. Faustus, um, about a composer. Um, think about how many novels are actually today written about composers, um, whose protagonist, seeing the wreckage of World War II and the Holocaust, writes, I want to revoke the Ninth Symphony. Um, it's a statement of pessimism, nihilism, rot. Um, so this crisis of modernity, of civilization and its discontents um, has, has dominated 19th and 20th century thought and is something that I think is very present in our minds today. It should become clear if you look at the scene that the enlightenment is far from accomplished. Um, as the poet E.E. E. Cummings wrote, nothing recedes like progress. I'd like to turn now back to the music a little bit. Um, the Agnus Dei and Dona Nobis Pacem that, that follows, it, it's a very idiosyncratic section of Beethoven. It's almost difficult to approach as a listener. It almost ends with a question mark in this kind of unresolved hmm, moment. Um, it doesn't have the symmetry of the Kyrie, the propulsive energy of the Gloria the majesty of the credo or these mysterious heavenly visions of the Sanctus and Benedictus. So we're kind of in the sphere of humankind left to figure things out for ourselves. Um, and this is something that Beethoven's sort of humanistic theology would, would have us do. Uh, the opening of the movement, which we heard, um, it's, it's firmly earthbound, the texture, the bassoons and horns. The baritone, the bass baritone enters very low and in an unresolved key as Joseph Butel marvelously sings on, on our performance. Um, it's an out of the depths, I have cried unto thee, O Lord, moment. Very dark and naturalistic setting of the sacred text. Uh, the low voices of the choir, the tenors of, and basses almost form a prisoner's chorus. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. And then the men's chorus. Um, 
this, this plea out of the depths. But then the clouds begin to part. Um, as we turn to the text, uh, Dona nobis pacem, grant us peace. Uh, we hear in the orchestra a cappella, Agnus Dei. Let's hear a little bit of that. So we hear this pastoral character, this rollicking kind of 6-8 tempo. You're put in mind of uh, Be Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, this, the pastoral symphony, the last movement. so forth. Um, it's incredibly characterful music and, and very, um, very Beethoven. Beethoven loved walks through the woods and through the fields. Um, this is where he worked out his musical ideas. Um, devastatingly, it was when he was on one of his uh, country hikes when he realized that he was really starting to go deaf because he could no longer hear the shepherd's flute um, in the background. He could see him playing, but that high frequency had already left him. So we're in a place of comfort and uh, this almost Arcadian vision of, of Beethoven and his interaction with nature. Um, the real world, however, is not far away. Um, in the midst of this pastoral kind of character, we have these amazing kind of stark war interruptions right in the middle of this Arcadian landscape. The first one, which we'll listen to now, is marked mit Engtlich, with angst, with anxiety. Let's listen to it. almost a direct uh, correspondence to Haydn's Mass in Time of War from about 20 years before. Uh, listen to this uh, quotation from the last section of, of Haydn's setting of the same text. <laughs> Thank you. 
So again, all the influences coming into to Beethoven's uh, composition of this work. The second uh, war interruption comes after uh, a, a beautiful kind of extension of the Dona Nobis theme. <laughs> This again is another allusion to Handel. Um, if you think of the, the famous Hallelujah Chorus from Messiah. He shall reign forever and ever. Um, he takes this music and runs it through uh, his, his own kind of summation of a prayer for peace. Uh, then after this is a second war interruption. This one even more chaotic and crazy than the first one, almost as if you see the population scattering away from the market square, followed by this incredible bombardment. Let's listen to that. anxiety-producing uh, music at that point. Uh, very difficult for the orchestra to, to, to get through these crazy figures. Um, however, now with the war vanquished and receding into the background, we return to nature, optimism, the Arcadian vision, uh, orchestra playing little raindrop and bird call figures. However, with a distant drummer, um, the only lingering echo of what went before. Let's listen to this place almost towards the end of the work. So you can almost barely hear that. Distant timpani. And in one of his sketchbooks, Beethoven writes timpani at the end as a sign of peace. Beethoven inscribed this entire movement, uh, the section called Dono Nobis Pacem, as a prayer for inner and outer peace. And indeed, the work ends optimistically, almost matter-of-factly. No great fanfares, but a simple vision of humanity stepping forward into the sunshine. Beethoven was a complicated man. Um, the theme of aloneness that we kind of started this series with, uh, he is of himself alone, and to his aloneness, all things owe, owe their being. Um, is something that, that corresponded with his own feeling of loneliness. He was actually a very sociable uh, person who ached for connection and socializing. Um, notoriously crotchety, of course, but he inspired huge loyalty and devotion from those who were close to him. And when you think about the achievement, especially of his later works, of imagining all this music that he couldn't hear, um, you almost have to scroll forward to someone like Stephen Hawking um, who was able through the, the prison potentially of his disability to imagine universes. Um, 
And in a way, because of his depth, deafness, we actually have a lot more of Beethoven's in, intimate thoughts and correspondence than we might have otherwise had. He kept with him conversation books, some of which we've quoted from, uh, that, that really expressed a lot of his musical ideas, but ideas about life and, and himself. And, and in a real sense, um, his disability made him more connected with reality, more expressive, more alive to the universe, more attuned to musical ideas that only he could hear and now that we can hear. Beethoven was all about creating beauty, in other words, um, directness and authenticity. And the words of one of his biographers, I think, sort of sum it up perfectly for me. If we lose our awareness of the transcendent realms of play, beauty, and kinship, that are portrayed in the great affirmative works of our culture. If we lose the reconciling dream of the Ninth Symphony, and I might also add the Misa Solemnis, there may remain no counterpoise against the engulfing terrors of civilization. Nothing to set against Auschwitz and Vietnam as a paradigm of humanity's possibilities. This is what we see in great works of art that are carefully crafted by great thinkers. And I've really enjoyed sharing this, this marvelous work with you over the last few sessions. I encourage you to share it with others and follow us at www.thechoralsociety.org. And now let's listen to the final section of Beethoven's Misa Solemnis, recorded by the Choral Society and Orchestra at Grace Church in New York, May 2019. Once again, Tammy Petty, Helen Karlowski, Dan Cokewell, and Joseph Butel, our fabulous soloists, who we should all give a big hand to right now. And I'll close with the words that Beethoven himself wrote at the top of his autograph score for the Misa. It's the embodiment of everything he wanted to express. From the heart, may it also go to the heart.
Oh, oh, oh. 